Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Life in the Law. It must be Wednesday at 1. We're here with Life in the Law. We're here with Tracy Ryan. Uh, Tracy is the leader of Apple, and I'll let you tell the viewers what Apple stands for, so I, I don't flub it, Tracy. Uh, it just stands for Arresting Prostitutes is Legal Exploitation. And we're going to discuss that. We're going to discuss the rights of sex workers today. And this is a very, uh, I think, in a hot topic, an interesting topic. And I'm delighted to have you on, Tracy. Thank you. So w explain to the audience, uh, I, I, I guess, what sex work is, but what sex workers' rights are, really, more importantly. Well, uh, sex workers um, are often in areas in different parts of the world where various aspects of sex work have become criminalized. Uh, particularly prostitution, although sex work can apply to working in pornography, uh, it can apply to stripping, anything where someone is using their sexual nature, their sexuality to earn a living mm. could be called sex work. Uh, but mostly what we're talking about is prostitution because that's what's typically illegal in most venues. Right. Um, and the sex workers' rights movement is it doesn't have uniformity in, in the absolute details of everything, but generally what we want is what's called a decriminalization of prostitution. And by decriminalization, what they mean is we want to repeal the laws and uh, not replace them with a lot of bureaucracy. Right. Uh, they use the term legalization to refer to a system where the government has created a, a, a bureaucracy to regulate, to regulate prostitution, which is also popular and has been adopted in various parts of the world. Uh, sex workers have problems with that because they have problems with a lot of the times that they're not really in the position of contributing to the discussion on what the regulations are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the regulations are made for the benefit of, of others and not for their benefit. Right. So there's, there's controversies there as well. Right, right. That's interesting. I, n I never thought about that, that sex workers w wouldn't be at the table when laws are being designed, but I, I, I see that that is probably the case, although it shouldn't be the case. I well, mean, it's widely been the case in all sorts of studies and task force and things that are done on the issue that sex workers are not at the table, yeah. unless they're claiming victim status, in which case they're very welcome. But if they're not claiming victim status, they're, they're basically uh, not welcome in the discussion. Right, and I think we should talk about that with the audience. Um, about the at the choice of being a sex worker that that it is a volitional choice in many instances i won't say in 100 percent of instances but in many instances and it's uh many single mothers depend on on this kind of work uh, a lot of women that don't have the, the kind a lot, a lot of women that have the education but the, certainly that don't have the education depend on this kind of work and um i think i imagine the laws are not uh, enforced fairly for one thing. I don't think there are any laws on the books which are enforced fairly. <laughs> so I don't think prostitution can be uh, singled out for that. Uh, I do feel that, um, y you know, there are probably several million people in the world who work either full-time or part-time um, selling sex. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no typical sex worker. There's no typical prostitute in the world. And we deal with a lot of you know, studies and experts who come forward and saying this is the face of prostitution and this is and this is a face perhaps, but there's no such thing as a typical face. Right. Um, and, you know, in Hawaii we have a lot of trans women who do sex work traditionally here, mm -hmm. which is common among trans women worldwide. Um, Prostitution is probably the single largest employer of trans women in, in the world. Huh. I, fascinating. Um, yeah. Um, and it's, it's not if you, a, lower, a smaller percentage of trans women do prostitution now than 30 years ago because they're more accepted in other ways of life. Um, then you have the, the, the teenagers, the runaways, uh, survival sticks. And um, by UN definition, anyone who's under the age of majority who's selling sex is a trafficking victim. Okay. That's by definition. It doesn't matter if there's anyone who's controlling or exploiting them. Just because they're underage, they're called a trafficking victim, which is a great way to pump up the numbers of alleged victims. Right. Because right. there are a lot of um, people on the streets who are um, full-time or part-time often selling sex and doing other things. Um, very, very few of these people have a, have a pimp or a controller. Right. Um, a New York study said it was probably 10%. Right. Um, then you've got adult consensual sex workers, which is, you know, a large group of people, men, women, transgendered people, mm -hmm. all doing, uh, selling sex and in different types of ways, you know, off the internet, 
um, in the old days, you, you might work for a, um, an escort service right. and you had all the ads in the yellow pages. The internet right. largely replaced that. There are people working in brothels and massage parlors, people working in legal, legal areas in various parts of the world. Like Would you say that the internet has um, broadened is, uh, the number of people that, like say part-timers, that, I mean, because you, can, you're, you have direct access to the market. You, it's, it's, you, know, you put an ad on Craigslist, one, two, three, and you're in business. I mean, it, well, you work you as much as you want to or mm -hmm. need to. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there, there are pitfalls that you can get into into prostitution, which you can get into other things, such as addiction, mm -hmm. which, which happens. And if you get into that situation, then you're no longer working as much as you want to. You're working as much as you need to, right. which is bad. And I would argue it's almost not a volitional choice at that point, no. you know. Well, it's, it's, it's the only way to pay the bills because right. drugs are illegal and that makes them expensive. Right. Um, so what would you say to people, and I don't agree with this, but what would you say to people that, you know, we can't decriminalize prostitution, or we can't decriminalize sex work, please excuse me for using the term prostitution, we can't de decriminalize sex work uh, because it will lead to an uptick in, you know, illegal drug use? Well, there's no, there's no uh, logical association betw between that. Um, you could say we can't decriminalize sex work because it will lead to more gun violence or more revolutions or nuclear war. You can say all right. those things, but right. you'd actually have to provide some concrete evidence as to why someone having sex implies that they have to use, they have to use drugs. I think that you're, you get two completely different problems. And I think that the problem with drugs and addiction needs to be dealt with, dealt with as a drug and addiction problem, not a problem because sex workers are doing it or plumbers are doing it. Right, 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 right. I, I agree. I, I, you know, it's funny you mentioned uh, g gun violence. Um, I imagine if, if sex workers decriminalized, there'd be a reduction in violence against uh, sex workers. Well, it would be one of the people don't, people are, are so hearing so much of this propaganda about pimps and traffickers yeah, that they no. think this is the real cause of harm to trip to prostitution. But prostitutes, people who are selling sex, people in the sex industry are much more likely to be a, be a victim of violence from police officers than from a pimp. Really? Yes. That's fascinating. And that's because very few prostitutes have pimps. Right. But they all, in the United States, except in some places in Nevada, are on the, on the receiving end of, of law enforcement. And we've had a whole study in the paper this, this past week about, you know, misadventures of our police department here. And our police department here is really not that bad compared to others, despite all these reports. Um, really? Because it seems, if you read the no. paper, it's... I know girls who worked in the 70s, trans women who worked in Chinatown in the 70s, and they hardly ever got arrested in the 70s. But what they got was called dirty lickens. Oh, really? They just get beat up. Yeah, wow. They just get beat up. The police, you're, you're acting up, you just get beat up. Well, it's such a disparity They don't do that anymore. You know, now if, it's, if that happens, it's a big, it's a rogue cop. But it didn't right. used to be. It used to be commonplace. Right, right, right. Uh, how do we empower sex workers? I mean, how, how, do you, how do you propose we empower sex workers? Well, you have to deal with the statutes. I mean, we right now, we're there, the anti-prostitution people are doing the best they can to set up a two-tiered system for people doing the same thing. If you claim that you are a trafficking victim, then you don't get arrested, you don't get to jail, you get all sorts of social services, you get education, you get support, you can get all those things. If you, if you don't, but if you, if you don't claim trafficking victim status, then you get jail, a criminal record that follows you around for years, harassment by the police, and a bad reputation which may keep you from getting a job or getting married. So, so you're creating a system where um, you, you're encouraged to make up a victim, I was victim say, story. There is you're, you're, a, and right, most a of the propaganda. victim stories, as far as the ones that I've heard, are at least, at least partly fabricated, and some of them are just made up. Right. Um, but to, in order to be uh, a sex trafficking victim, do you have to be under a certain age? Or no, no, that's age can be any age. No, no. If you're under 18, you're a sex trafficking victim by definition, no matter what happened mm -hmm. to you. If you're over 18, you have to have an, a victimizer, an exploiter, right. who forced you or coerced you into oh, prostitution. Okay. So it's two different, I two see, different I things see. which are lumped in, badly lumped in under the same definition, I right. think. Um, but the, the point is that um, if we want to ha hear the voices of sex workers, we have to give them the freedom to speak and to advocate without being, being threatened with going to jail for doing so. Right. We Absolutely. have to get rid of the gag rules. Um, when the Bush administration started this war on trafficking, one of the first things they did is said that if you're an, a non-government organization getting U.S. foreign aid money, 
uh, you have to sign a pledge saying you will never advocate for legalized or decriminalized prostitution, or you won't get any of our federal money. Well, that's a lot of uh, pressure. So all these groups like um, groups in South Asia, which have big sex worker groups, which are fighting AIDS, mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're cut off from U.S. AIDS money because right. they wouldn't sign this, because they're all sex worker groups. Right. Right. Um, then it, it, it had a, a chilling effect on the, on the United States. An example is Barbara Brent's UNLV did a study of the brothels in Nevada, uh -huh. but it wasn't a negative study. It showed, look, they're basically safe places to work. Right. So she gave it to the Nevada Anti-Trafficking Task Force. The Nevada Anti-Trafficking Task Force says, if we circulate this to our members, we'll lose our federal funding, because it doesn't fit the agenda. Well, that doesn't seem right. I mean, no. to, to be... No, uh, you I can't... Can so even, go, even you can't the university research is yeah. being suppressed by the government if it conflicts with the anti-trafficking right. goals of the government. Well, I have to tell you that I'm old enough uh, to remember uh, the 70s and the 80s oh, yeah. and the 90s. And I have noticed that among... In, the, in, in media... A very, very favorite story to tell is the sex trafficking story. These middle European, uh, you know, Europeans know. Uh, bring girls in containers and, and keep them, you know, I mean, this is a very, this is a really common trope now. This wasn't always the, the trope. I mean, in the 70s and 80s, to some extent, there was, sex workers were empowered. They were sort of we, glamorized and, we were and, making and idolized. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, if you watch a television program on a cable station that says has the word "sex slaves" in its in its title, you're almost certainly looking at manipulative propaganda. There's almost there's likely to be very little that's true in that story, and you can watch them for just a few minutes. And and whenever somebody who they're interviewing a sex person contradicts it, a narrator comes in and corrects what is explains away what they've said. Right, right, right. Uh, every time. Right. Uh, and it's like you, they had a girl who's you know, sitting in jail and they're pesting her and she's telling a trafficking story. This guy does all this horrible, blah, 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 everything they want to hear. And then they said, well, am I arrested? And they said, no, we're not going to arrest you, but we can send you to, to, to be saved, to arrest. She says, no, I want to leave with my boyfriend. <laughs> as soon as she's not arrested, the right. whole story changes. Right, exactly. And, they, and they're saying, we don't understand how, why she won't uh, does get away from this. Like, she just lied. She just played you. She just told you this, what you want to hear to get out of going to jail. But I mean, certainly like, there must be circumstances of people being exploited? There are. There certainly are. There's some uh, Pam Vessels who worked in Waikiki for over 10 years working with us. So there are really some really bad pimps out there who do horrible, horrible things to people. These people should be the ones who are prosecuted. But they should be prosecuted for their acts, not because they are in a status which someone has to defined as, as right. pimp, which doesn't even mean anything. Right. They should be prosecuted for their acts well, under the evident, rules of evidence which are established in law. That's how you do that. Right. That's what we're, we're in favor of. I mean, you can say, you know, argue me, how big a sex trafficking problem is there in the United States? Well, if there's one victim, there's a problem. Right. I, and we can yeah. say that. Yeah. But we're, we don't need to have these people spinning the numbers saying there's thousands and thousands. I know, I've noticed, as I said, I noticed my, uh, myself this, this, this sort of spin. Uh, yeah. T it's an iron triangle spin. between um, the rescue organization, which has a vested financial interest in, in saying there's big numbers, because that's where the funding comes from. The media who hypes it up, and the politicians who hype it up. And so you keep, each time it goes around the circle, it it's increases. It's The Guardian of London did a study where they had started with 63 foreign-born sex workers in London. Nobody interviewed them, but they all been, because they're foreign-born, they're trafficking victims. Oh, without I Without interviewing. Oh. And it went from 63 to we think it's bigger, to we think it's around this triangle, media poll, uh -huh. and it ended up being 50,000 oh, in wow. Britain. After That's about five years, from 63 actual cases, which nobody even interviewed right. to determine if they're sex trafficking right. victims. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we can go further explore this subject. And I, I think that's very, a very eye-opening statistic that you just quoted there. Um, it's like a game of telephone, you know. There's n we need real, you know, honest data and make, to make good choices in this area. Yeah. So we're going to take a quick break, and uh, we'll be back in a minute. Hi, my name is Aaron Wills. You are watching thinktechhawaii.com. I am the host of the show, Rehabilitation, coming soon. You can watch us live at thinktechhawaii.com at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. I will see you there. Hello, I'm Crystal from Quok Talk. I've got a new show here. You've got to tune in, check out my topics on sensitive, provocative female issues. So, Tuesday mornings, 10 o'clock. Don't miss it. It's going to be fun and dangerous. Aloha everybody, 
My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Chantel Seville, host of the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. This show is for you. It's all about inspiring and empowering girls of the future to do what they love, get out there, and be healthy, fit, and confident. If you're up for that, 11 a.m. every Wednesday, I'll see you there. Hi, you're watching Life in the Law. I'm Marion Sasaki. I'm with Tracy Ryan. We were just agreeing that, uh, that if there is a sex trafficking problem, not everybody should be lumped into under that category and arrested. Is that, did I say that in a well, that's pretty way? much it. I yeah. mean, you, there, there's, first of all, you should follow the basic rules of evidence. And right now, the advocates want to pay, punish people with what they call, um, strict liability offenses for everything. So it's like, you don't actually actually have done anything, but if you cross this little line, we assume you've done all those other things. We don't need any evidence. The strict liability is yeah. very black and white. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very harmful, and that's the direction we're working on. Um, so again, we're, they're getting away with things like evidence. They don't want the evidence. In fact, when the Hawaii Anti-Trafficking Tort Task Force made its report to the legislature a few years back, the anti-trafficking advocate had a minority opinion that went on for pages. And in there, she said, the whole problem is of convicting these people is it requires evidence. <laughs> that was her, do you, we, we have, to show, we have to show there was evidence of force. If we get rid of that and just throw anybody in, in jail, even without the evidence, then we can, well, then we can get the bad guys. Right. Said, oh yeah, North Korea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's a little, a little, well, just a little this detail. Is, this, is, this is the attitude, because in, in their mind, everybody is a slave and being exploited. We don't need any stinking evidence. So what problems, specifically in Hawaii, legal problems do prostitutes face here? Um, obviously, there's a tremendous transient population of tourists and so on, so I, may, I imagine that makes certain unique problems, and there have certain been laws to address that. Well, there's, we have several different types of, of statutes, and it's the... The primary statute that we have dates from the early 70s. Um, prior to that, the prostitution law didn't involve the, the, the requirement that money changed hands. If a woman was promiscuous, she could be a common prostitute, prostitute. Then they cleaned all that up. In the 1970s, they wrote some fairly clear and easily understood statutes. I, didn't agree, I don't agree with them, but at least people knew what was in and what was out. Right, you know? right. Um, interesting thing, in the commentary to the existing prostitution law, uh, when the legislature said why they did it, they indicated that they didn't really have a very good easy, um, reason. I have a copy of their commentary here, which I'm just going to read briefly. Defining this public policy is a difficult task. Perhaps it more correctly ought to be considered in terms of public demand, a widespread community attitude which the penal law must take into account regardless of the questionable, questionable rationales upon which it is based. So that's what the legislature determined for the reason for the prostitution law. They right. couldn't find any good reason for it, but the people seemed right. to want it. Right. Uh, under our state constitution, that's unconstitutional constitutional. Right. People in the state of Hawaii have a right to liberty. It's right there in the Article 1. Right. 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 So, yeah, this is an ambiguous... It, you uh, know, it goes on with this, and it says these re venereal diseases not prevented by laws. It doesn't stop people from being exploited. None of these laws do any of the things that we're saying there. We've, sh we've looked at this. It's right. nonsense. Right. But we're doing it anyway. But I d I don't you think it... <laughs> It just makes people feel virtual. Uh, you know, it's sort of, uh, why do people become evangelical? You know, Well, I had a long email back and friend, forth with a friend of mine who said that we're, we're, this is contrary to the country's Judeo-Christian tradition if we legalize prostitution. Right. That's, and that's the reason why we should send people to jail because of our religious beliefs. Right. Well, that's contrary to our constitution, constitution. Mm -hmm. and then, well, of course, then we're getting told the constitution is based on the Bible, regardless of what it says. I think it's just so, so deeply ingrained, you know, um, although, you know, Christians might uh, do well to remember that Mary Magdalene was a sex worker, but people mm -hmm. seem to forget that, right? Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it is, there's a racist component to it. You know, they're, they're, black people are very heavily targeted under our prostitution laws. The, the conference I just came from, there are a lot of black sex workers there, and they were telling this, I mean, they set up these zones for prostitution, which are all in black neighborhoods, and they'll just harass any black woman who's right. out in the neighborhood right. in high heels. You're going to get arrested because you're, you look like a prostitute. So there are class issues in prostitution yeah. as well. Yeah. I'm sure that high-end prostitutes do not, or sex workers, don't aren't hassled in the same way that well, they get stings 
they get stings, and I know a number of escorts who've been victims of stings here in Hawaii, because the police are pressured by the, you know, the anti-prostitution people are press pestering them to arrest these women to save them. Right. And um, the women don't want to be saved, but in the, in, the, in the dialogue, that just means they're too afraid of their pimp, even though no one can find any pimp anywhere. Now, you know, I've heard this argument before, and I, I wonder your opinion on this argument, uh, uh, that prostitution, um, sex work, this kind of work is a manifestation of some childhood trauma, and that the reason uh, these women should be protected is because they're sort of acting out this childhood trauma, you know, through whether it's drug abuse or prostitution or, I mean, they, need, they do need to be saved, you know, because they're, 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 they're no, going one, no one's going to get saved unless they want to get saved. And people who try to run these you know, Pam Vessels, when she ran her home, home for people who were exiting prostitution, at the beginning they took referrals from girls who had been arrested, and then after a year or so they just gave it up, because this is a complete waste of time. When people are ready to exit the industry, that's when they're ready to be helped. Right. And that's one of the cornerstones of harm reduction. And there are a lot of good organizations in, the, in Hawaii, the Yo Project, Youth Outreach, Shao Project does Needle Exchange, Life Foundation does uh, AIDS, good, good, solid harm reduction organizations who practice these policies. They work with people. What is your current, what would you, what do you want to change in your life? Like if you're a drug user, you want to use clean needles so you don't get, right. you don't get AIDS. Right. And if you're a prostitute, you want condoms, whatever. Right. So they work with people and build up relationships rather than working against them. Right. and trying to judge them. Right. That's the harm reduction approach. Right. And these are the people who are in the best uh, position to know anything about this industry in Hawaii, but none of them are included on the anti-trafficking task force. They, they, they're afraid to go to the legislature on their own because they might lose funding for not saying the right thing politically. It's a very, very, very bad situation. So what can we do? Well, right now we're, you know, we're working with a new group of allies. Amnesty International, as a lot of people have heard, has come out in favor of supporting the sex workers' rights movement. In the local Amnesty chapter, the women there is very gung-ho in helping us. Uh, and uh, recently we finally got a large group of the um, gay and lesbian political this, organizations yeah. have finally realized this is an issue that they should talk about. Lambda has been on board. Two big transgender rights organizations in mainland have, have said yes, we should do this. So right. the alliance is growing. Plus, um, main uh, magazines and newspapers are starting to challenge this, all the anti-trafficking stuff that's going. Reason Magazine, which is a libertarian-oriented magazine on the mainland, has wrote, written a number of stories challenging this whole trafficking paradigm and saying they're using this as the new war on drugs, as wow. a new way you to... You know, I never have, thought to, to, to question it. I'm so glad you're on because you've, you've, uh, you've opened my eyes to a whole new area of thought. I mean, I never thought... You know, I thought, oh, this is happening, this horrible scourge is happening, and it's happening all over. It's happening in high schools. It's happening in cities. It's happening among, you know, women from Asia. It's happening from women from yeah. Europe. But, I, I, but it, you're, you're it, saying I, it's not I, ha really happening as much as they say it's, it's happening. It's happening. But the numbers are bogus. And the, 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 the over, they rely heavily on anecdotal stories told by people who are under pressure to tell those sto right, stories. Right. Nandita Sharma, who's a, a professor at the University of Hawaii, when she was with York University in Canada, went to Vancouver and interviewed 25 trafficking victims there. Uh, these weren't all sex trafficking. This was just general trafficking, came in from China. And they'd all try to get asylum as trafficking victims and all told whatever the story was. And she interviewed them after they'd been den denied asylum. 25, of 25 said they'd lied about being a trafficking victim. But 25 well, out of 25 had made up the story. That's, yeah, wow. That's serious. Yeah. And this is a serious problem because we do want to be able to rely on witnesses to prosecute genuine harmful yeah, people. But when we set up this entire system to punish all these people who aren't telling right. the trafficking story so we can pump up our trafficking numbers and get all the money, that's a bad system. So are there, I, you know, I keep thinking, you know, unionize. Like, are there unions? Are there groups? Are there workers' groups? There have been different ty efforts to have prostitutes organize. Uh, there's, and on the mainland, there's a lot of swap chapters, um, sex workers outreach projects, mm -hmm. which have both allies and sex workers involved in many mm -hmm. places. Uh, the biggest organization is in um, uh, India, in the, in the Calcutta region. They've got oh, really? 65,000 sex workers. Wow in a union, and they work to try to keep the underage girls off the street, to identify traffickers, to deal with AIDS, and do all these things themselves. But they're the kind of organization that's being fought by the United States. Really? Yeah, because that's pro-sex worker. 
So the federal government is trying to defund them, trying to marginalize them, and instead they've got these people from these different, you know, evangelical church groups who are coming in right. with, with the support from American churches right. to try and do all this stuff and push aside right. all the stuff that's being done locally by sex workers. That's unfortunate because that's really the right tactic to take is to keep out underage, uh, you know, you know, to keep out children, keep out, you know, people that might be, you know, harmed. It's, that's there was a story on, um, on some show about uh, some place in India where they, some parents sold their 14-year-old girl to a brothel. And she had to work there till she paid off the debt. And so they didn't even start her prostituting till she was 15. The first year she was just a maid. Okay. And the reason they did that is if they, didn't, they know there's not enough John's men to purchase underage girls to make it worthwhile. And if they hold her back, she'll be working longer into her adult word to pay off the debt. Oh, I see. I so see. it's it's a hmm. business decision. It's not like they're kind to children, yeah. but it's it's we you know we listen to the anti trafficking thing, and if you listen to them, they think that there's all these thirteen year old girls out there and all these men who are pedophiles. That's what that's where what all I, these pedophiles I've coming from. That's I mean, what, it's crazy. what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, that's what I believed. I think that the, these rings of people and a, you know they steal these girls. But I'm so glad that you're here and you're sort of you're giving well, us the, the other Polaris side. the Polaris Project, which is one of these anti projects, puts out all this nonsense about this and rates all the states. You're getting a bad rating from Polaris because you haven't done all our laws, which they're listening to in our legislature. Why are you listening to these nuts? They're the ones who are putting out that the average age of prostitution is 13 years. They've been putting it out for years. Finally, they start getting challenged and then the Washington Post took it up. This is the first time the mainstream, other than the libertarian press, has took it up. Right. And then they had to answer it. Washington Post looking, so we think it might be like 18. So for That's like a big 15 difference. years they've been saying 13 yeah. and now they say, well, maybe it's 18. Well. That's so this is this is just, but the thirteen still circulates everywhere. Right. It does. It's all Everybody right, thinks. It's all thirteen now. No. I, I no, want no. to thank you so much for. Ha I want to thank you for coming on, and I'd love to have you on again. And I'd love to have you, if it's possible, to have some sex workers who are, uh, you know, w happily ensconced in sex work and not ashamed to come forward or not afraid to come forward. Come on the show. I lo I'd love to talk to people. I'd love. I'd love to. Uh, bring more light to this issue because I do think this is an issue of uh, oppression and uh, vi Victorian morals and, and well, it's, authoritarian it's, it's oppression. It's very difficult when a friend of mine uh, has, a, has a conviction from 1991 and as a result she can't get student aid to go to HCC to, to improve herself. That's ridiculous. That's just ridiculous. Yeah. So, well, on that note, I want to thank you, Tracy. I hope to see you again. Uh, my name is Marianne Sasaki. You've been watching Life in the Law on thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, join us on, at 1 o'clock on Wednesday, every Wednesday.